scrubbing, truing, shooting and smoothing. The number 5 will do it all if you know how to tune and set it up. This is probably one of my favourite planes over the last couple of years. I tuned it up about two years ago into a super smoother and it really is the business. But what are the stars of this series? Well they're these two. Both number fives come from different castings, you might be able to see a few differences there. You may notice on the bottom of this some permanent marker and a few little um, sandpaper marks. I did use this to demonstrate the theory of flattening of the sole once, but it's really had very little work done on it. Uh, the other plane, some surface rust on it, nothing really bad, no deep pitting I don't think. Now to be honest, if you're going to tune up a plane, avoid anything that's got a cracked sole or a sole that's been welded. And, you know, there are so many on the market, why not try and get one that's in reasonable condition like this to start with? You won't pay a lot more than one that's all rusty. Now, if you've inherited a plane so it's got some sentimental value and it's very rusty, well, you can still go through the process and hopefully you'll get one that works pretty well. The first step would be to soak it for a few days in white vinegar, which will help the rust come off. You get a lot of the rust off, you probably end up with a plane that's in a similar condition to this one. So what's my plan for these two number fives, and why do I need three? Well, like I said, this is my go-to plane at the moment, the super smoothing number five. So I'm not going to change that's the function of that one. Out of these two, well, number five is good for lots of different tasks. Uh, one of those is preparing rough boards. So I'm going to turn one of these into a number five scrub. I've not seen it done before. Um, I know it's just a case of you can open up the frog, so you get a bigger mouth, put a curve on the blade, and you can use it as a scrub plane. I want to try and take that a little step further. The other one, well, I'm going to turn that into a proper jack. So flat sole, squared sides, and we'll probably prepare a couple of blades for this, one slightly cambered, one perfectly straight. So, a lot of work to do on these. The first thing to do will be to tear them apart and clean up all the components. next stage to strip it down would be to remove the yoke which will mean pushing out this little hinge pin and removing the lateral adjuster lever which will mean filing off the top of this rivet. Whether I go ahead and remove the lateral adjuster will depend on how free it is to move. I've given it a quick squirt of WD-40 and that rivet is a snug fit but it's easy enough to move. So I'm happy that that can stay in, as long as it doesn't get in my way too much. The other thing that can get in the way is the blade adjustment yoke. The little lever that comes up through the frog. Always, no matter what position you put it in, is above the level that the blade sits on. Consequently, when you're trying to level this off later on, that's always going to be in the way, or potentially in the way. Now, I prefer to leave them in, so we'll check for flatness here first of all. If there's an awful lot of work to do, then it will be worth removing this little guy. I'm going to use a stiff brush first of all to get rid of most of the muck. A once over with scotch bite on the sole and sides is also a good idea. As for the small components, the screws etc, I'm going to use some paraffin which I find extremely good for this. We now need to make the decision how much further do we go. With this one plane we've got bits of paint and glue still on there and I'm going to take a scraper and get off most of that. After that we've got the handles, they're in pretty poor condition and I think probably the best thing for those would be to remove all the varnish that's on them and give them a coat of oil. So let's take a quick look and the plane which I thought was in the, the worst condition to begin with is actually looking the better of the two. The other one has some rust still on there, a bit of rust pitting. If you started with a rusty plane, yours is still going to look worse than this at this stage. And it's when we get onto the, the hard abrasives that you'll start to see some improvement. 
The next step I'm going to look at is fitting the frog nicely to the body of the plane. The frog itself has two small pads and one long pad. These smaller pads contact either one or two pads on either side at the front of the body and this larger one contacts either two or four smaller pads uh, further back on the body of the plane. What we try and achieve when we fit the frog is for it not to rock at all when it's against the body of the plane and for it not to flex when we tighten it down. And I'll do that on my flat reference plate. I'll set my reference up off the bench so that I can sit the frog with its large flat surface down on there. These pads don't touch the bench. I can hold it well and work it along an abrasive. I'm going to work on a piece of 180 paper. I'm not changing the paper at all, I'm keeping it exactly where it is and I'm gauging the amount of time I'm spending wearing this away and I'm just wearing it until the mill marks disappear. That should hopefully allow me to do exactly the same with the two front pads. If I remove those mill marks then the gap between the two planes should remain the same. And you can see here I've removed virtually all the mill marks and that's as far as I believe I need to go. Just work on these two pads now. Because they're smaller, just take a little bit of care to make sure you're working evenly on that surface. And that's taken it to the same sort of degree as the large pad. So these two planes should now still be the same distance they were apart before we started. To check the fit of the frog, I like to install the blade. This allows me then to put the frog in position and check exactly how forwards it could ever possibly go. Check then at the back how far the two pieces are offset from each other and then when you're doing your fitting you need not go any further than that. So with the frog installed at the most forward position it could ever be used in, you want to check for any rock. Now I grab hold with a finger and thumb around this area here on both sides and try and rock either backwards and forwards or side to side. And would you believe it, this is the first plane where it's been absolutely flat with no rock. And actually I checked the other one and it's exactly the same. So I've been incredibly lucky. Chances are yours won't be. So I'll show you what you need to do to correct for that. Now to correct that fault I find the easiest way is to scrape material away. And for that I've taken an old file. I've ground the tip off nice and flat. And I've ground away the teeth on one side for about a sixteenth of an inch. That gives me a nice sharp corner that I can use to scrape away material. To figure out where you need to remove material, I use a permanent marker, cover the pads, which I've done here already, and let that dry, and install the frog, and move it around. You'll notice a couple of things. First of all, the permanent marker begins to get worn away in the areas that touch first. Now bearing in mind that we flatten all the pads off, those shiny areas here must be slightly high. So we tackle those high points with our scraper. Uh, I don't know if I said just now, but I've also created a scraping point on the narrow edge to get to the smaller areas that you start off with in this process. So all the bright areas now, we just take a little scraping. You should find that your file will remove the cast iron very easily. You can of course use a commercial scraper. Now you probably noticed that I had to scrape a little area here, here, here and here, all four corners. And the reason is of course my frog wasn't rocking. Uh, those four points were holding it nice and level. We can rub again. Just continue with that process until the amount of marker that gets removed every time is, is quite large. In previous videos I've said work away until you've got a fit that's a contact area of about I think 80% I've said. Um, you probably don't need quite that much but it's a very easy process to do if you've got the time you can continue until you've got a perfect fit. An alternative method is to cut some sticky back sandpaper, cut to the right size for the pads, onto the frog, uh, place it in the body and then grind backwards and forwards until you're removing an equal amount of the permanent marker from each pad. That's what I've done in the past 
but I think this scraper version is, uh, is a quicker way to go and I find it quite easy. Now I like to tackle the face of the frog, which for good blade support and travel should be nice and flat. The lateral adjuster and the end of the yoke protrude out of the plane that we're trying to flatten. I think you can see there, a little bit higher. So we can't work that on the surface. However, we can work round them without too much bother. I'll put as much of the frog surface area on as I can. Move it backwards and forwards a few times. Take a quick look and see where I'm touching. And then I'll take as much surface area to one side of the attachments as I can. Work that. Then on the opposite side of the attachments. And I'll just work a little bit away until I've got a nice consistent scratch pattern. And we'll just check it with a straight edge. Perfect. The next assessment I'm going to make of the plane is for the squareness of the wings to the sole. So I've got a, an accurate engineer's tri-square. I'm just going to check that up against the light source. I don't know if you can see but actually that side is, is perfect. As is that one. So hey that's a, a stroke of luck. I hope one of them's a little bit out so I can at least show you what to do. Hooray! We've actually got one that's very slightly out of square. It's not very much and I don't know if you can see it. It's a little bit proud along the base. Next I want to check for flat across the width. So I'll use the blade of the tri-square. Very slightly low through the middle of the plane. To check the sole for, for flatness, I've got my reference straight edge. I've set up a light behind it and uh, basically you want to track look between the, the sole and the straight edge and see if you can see any light coming through. I'm seeing light coming through around about here. And so one and a half thou feeler gauge will fit in between the very front and about a third of the way towards the mouth of the plane. Now one and a half thou doesn't sound like very much and uh, in fact it isn't very much but when it comes to flattening the sole, it will actually take quite a while to do that. But first of all we want to check the rest of it, so I want to check down the middle. And once again, the one and a half thou, this time it's coming much closer to the mouth, about two thirds of the way towards the mouth. I also want to check for twist in that, it's just like uh, checking a board when you're planing a board. So I'll grab my winding sticks. That's actually looking perfect. You can check my wood preparation videos for how you check for twist. We're going to need to remove a bit of material through here and there whilst leaving a little bit in this area to bring the whole thing down flat. Now there may well be a lot of different ways of making something flat. The way I do my planes is I have a flat piece of granite, a roll of sandpaper, with the paper secured, it's then just a case of pushing the plane backwards and forwards. It may be a bit early, but if we look at our markings, we'll start to see that they're beginning to wear away. Now, I've been working for about half an hour, and most of the permanent marker has disappeared, become very faint. And I can see that I'm starting to touch the area where we were a little bit low but it means that we're getting close to where we're going to want to stop. So at this point, what I'm going to do is re-establish permanent marker right the way across up the plane. I know I'm very nearly where I want to be. If I just keep going the way I am until all of that permanent marker is being touched, then I know I'm flat. You can try different grips as well on the plane start to get tired. Just as long as you keep that pressure nice and even, front to back and side to side. If you've got a very rusty plane, don't go crazy about it. As long as about 90% of the sole is nice and flat without pitting, then you should be okay. And that's it. Every single line of permanent marker has got a lot of scratches across it, 
right the way along its right the way across its width and every one along the length. So I know that sole is very flat. Now I'll change this abrasive, which is quite coarse, to a finer one, just to make the sole of the plane a little bit more polished. When it comes to truing up the sides to 90 degrees to the sole, it just determine whether you need to remove material from down at the sole or up towards the, the tip of the wing. And that will determine where you put the pressure. If you need to remove material from the wing, the wing that's down on the sandpaper, then put most of your pressure down on this side of the plane and just use the other side to move it backwards and forwards. On this particular plane we need to remove material close to the sole and leave material up at the tip of the wing. So I'm putting all my pressure down on the sole side and any handling that I've got of the plane on this side, this edge, is purely for moving it backwards and forwards. I think you can see in the light that I'm just removing material up close to the sole leaving most of this alone and that's what we want to do and I just keep going back to my tri-square checking the angle and gradually creep up to 90 degrees. If you find there's a lot of material to remove you can always use the end of a mill file to scrape some of it away. Both of these soles are now lovely and flat. They're not perfectly smooth, there are a couple of rough areas which were originally low. Uh, they're flat now but they do still have some deeper score marks in them. They do feel lovely and smooth but with the light cast on them the way I've done it you can make out that there are some deeper grooves through these flattened areas. Once I've achieved a flat sole I can move on to a little bit of polishing. It's not essential to take it to a, a glassy mirror finish and in fact I like to take it to a slightly hazy mirror finish. I think you can see it does mirror quite well, but it's not like glass. And the thing is, if you do spend all that extra effort to make it a glassy mirror finish, it's going to get scratched up the very first time you use it because wood's abrasive. Now I've achieved flatness by working on my flat reference through grits of 80, 120, 180 and 240. And now that the plane is flat, I can do the final polishing freehand because the amount of material that I'm going to remove isn't going to make any difference to the flatness. I'm going to be using this ultra-fine foam-backed abrasive uh, which I got from Toolnut. It doesn't have a grit specified on it, but it feels about the same grit as a 400 wet and dry. And I want to work in little circles it's really just knocking off the tops of the rough surface left by the 240 paper and it won't affect the flatness of the sole. Finally I'm going to use some 4 steel wool with some Autosol metal polish and I'm going to work that again in circles just until I get the sort of reflective surface that I want. Just looking at the lever caps, it's obvious that there's a slight difference between the two. This one has actually had some attention and it's been polished up a bit. And if we look underneath, we can see that the leading edge which contacts the chip breaker has been either filed or ground nice and flat for a good contact. Whereas this one is, as is straight from the factory, pretty rough. So that would be the next thing to tackle, just to make sure we've got a nice flat area to contact the chip breaker. Try and think of the angle in which the, the tip of the lever cap contacts the chip breaker, and that's where you want to put the flat. So hold the lever cap at that sort of angle, and it won't take you very long to take away the roughness from the factory and create a nice flat area. And that's lovely and I'll just polish that up on some finer sandpaper. Both lever caps now have lovely smooth and flat areas for contacting the chip breaker. The one is lovely and smooth and will help clear the shavings and dust out of the mouth of the plane. The other one is a bit rough. So I'll just knock that back with some 4 aught steel wool and maybe a little bit of the Autosol paste.
If the handles aren't sound like these, then either repair or replace them. I'm going to strip, stain and shellac these and next time you see them they should look a lot better. Next thing to look at is the uh, chip breaker and the iron. If you have the money, the best thing to do is to get a replacement blade set. This blade set from Hock Tools is absolutely wonderful. I've got replacements in a number of my planes and I have to say Ron Hock really knows what he's doing when he makes these. So if you can afford it, get yourself one of those. The part of the blade that's most important is down towards this end. The chip breaker, the important part is at the front here where it touches the back of the blade. We need that to have nice good contact all the way along. So that should also be flat. And the other area of attention will be on the front rolled edge on this chip breaker. Some are just beveled. And that wants to be as smooth and polished as possible to help the shavings fly off nice and easily. I'm just using some steel wool to remove most of the fairly loose rubbish on the chip break and the blade. Now I'm going to use this abrasive impregnated rubber to get rid of most of this surface rust. Notice how I'm avoiding the area where we might be preparing an edge in the future. Now there are a number of sharpening systems out there. Um, I've been trialling diamond sharpening just recently so I'm going to use a diamond stone here. I've converted to this lapping fluid just recently rather than using water. I believe that's a real advantage. So we just put a little bit of that on the stone. I'm starting with, this is 400 grit. I'm working on the back of the blade so that's totally flat side, opposite to the bevel. And we're trying to flatten the area from the end up towards the hole in the middle which is where the attachment screw goes. You can't sharpen the blade any further than there so there's no point doing too much work further back than there. Lay the blade flat on the stone and then lightly backwards and forwards. And you'll see you take material away and create a scratch pattern across the blade. Now I want to flip the stone over because I've got a thousand grit on the other side. And when you've taken away the, the deeper scratches of the, the 400 grit, then you're good to go. Now for the chip breaker, the important thing is that the very tip of the chip breaker contacts tightly against the blade so that no shavings can get up there. Now with the chip breaker held towards the edge of the stone, we can lower this end down a little bit to ensure that the sharpest edge on the chip breaker is right at the front, which is where we want it. And then we just a few strokes until we've got a nice flat straight edge. Now I've got a consistent scratch pattern right the way across the edge, right to the tip. Whilst I've got the 400 grit diamond uppermost, I'm going to just touch up the edge, so raise it up onto the bevel. You might want to use a honing guide for this. You should better feel a burr come around that quickly onto the back of the blade. Now for general work, I like to just slightly camber the blade, so I put a bit more pressure alternately on each side of the blade. So back up to the bevel, a bit more pressure on this side, so no pressure here, a little bit of pressure there. And similarly, a little bit of pressure this side and none over here. And that will actually form a slight camber. Now I've changed to the thousand grit side. And I'm going to drag, first putting a little bit of pressure on one side, none on this side. And gradually as I come down the stone, transfer that pressure across to the other side. This should smooth the slightly pointed camber into a lovely sweet curve. And this time I'm going to drop the back of the blade down onto the stone. Light pressure across the 
end of the blade, blade flat on the stone and then just pull it away. A few times should remove the burr. A final strop will leave me with a super sharp edge. Then I polish the front of the chip breaker on the 1000 grit diamond. Now there is a bit of a flat spot on here. I wonder if somebody's had a go at it in the past and not made a very good effort. But I think that will polish reasonably okay on the strop now. And that's the sort of finish I'm looking for on the chip breaker. With chip breaker and iron attached you shouldn't be able to see any light coming through and I'm happy with that. The blade for the shooting plane can either be as we've just prepared it or perfectly straight but the iron for the scrub plane needs to be curved an awful lot more and I usually start that on coarse sandpaper. Now if I wanted to get really quite vicious with a scrub then I'd probably notch out the corners of the blade and put even more radius edge on it. Now to turn one of the planes into a scrubbing jack we need to turn our attention to its mouth. The mouth on this number five just isn't big enough to allow through enough of our heavily curved blade to, to use it as a scrubbing jack. So I'm going to open up the mouth by removing material from the back. Now you can see it's angled at roughly 45 degrees and we want to try and maintain that as we open up the mouth back this way. With the frog right back I've got roughly an eighth of an inch that I can remove at the back of the mouth. I'm going to apply some permanent marker at the back of the mouth. Now I'm going to scribe a sixteenth of an inch back because I might find that that gives me enough clearance. I'll use the back of a utility knife and you can see just how clear that is. That'll be an easy reference to follow as we're filing. With the plane clamped in my front vise, I can file the mouth big enough to get my larger file in. With that completed, I can refit my frog and check my clearances. Now I've got quite an extensive blade penetration there. I think you can probably see it. And I've still got plenty of room in the mouth to take those shavings. At least I think I have. I'll have to try it and find out. Now something that used to worry me is the amount of slack that you have on the spin wheel. There are two reasons you get slack. First problem you can sometimes find is that the little circular ends on the end of the yoke are not a close fit in the groove of the spin wheel. So you'll turn the spin wheel one way, unscrew it before it actually hits the other end of the yoke. If you've got one made of malleable iron then you can actually hammer it to make it a bit wider. The cast iron one like this, you can possibly shim in the groove with something like a circlip. But one of the areas that tends to cause a lot of slack is at the other end of that yoke, where the pin comes through that engages with the chip breaker. If I hold the blade here, you can probably see I spin from that position to that position and nothing's happening to the blade. The solution I came up with was a thin piece of sheet steel cut to the right width to fit in the slot, bend a little 90 degree on the end that will go into the slot and then bend the other end just to go over the end of the cap iron. The lever cap can go on top, we just need to take a couple of turns off the screw because we've got an extra piece of material in there and then adjust the screw so you've got the right sort of tension and the blade won't move. By judging the thickness of the shim, you should be able to reach a point where the only slack is about half a turn, which is what I've got on there now. If I'm going to be working with the mouth closed up nice and tight, then I like to put a slight bevel on this front side of the mouth as well. So not removing anything from the sole, we're just removing this top corner to allow a little bit more room once the shaving comes through. We want it nice and polished, so work through some sandpaper grits and eventually polish it. After just a few hours, these two number fives are ready to go and join my old one. 
I hope you'll agree, the results speak for themselves. Thank you so much for sticking it through to the end. Please do share, like, and leave comments and questions. Happy woodworking. Cheerio.